And so what made you stop being a running back, NFL running back? Age. Age? Oh, okay. Age and injury. I'm the only player from college to play in the NFL with no cartilage in my right ankle. And who did you play for? Arizona State. Oh, yeah? I was once a high school dropout from Mississippi. Ended up going to California, got into a junior college, became an All-American there, actually in the Hall of Fame there. And then I got a full-ride scholarship to Arizona State. And were you good at it? I was pretty good. Yeah. I, led, I led ASU in rushing. I was in the Hall of Fame at the junior college, and schools from all around the country wanted me, so I ended up going to Arizona State. Nice. Arizona State, at Arizona State, the Rams and the Oakland Raiders was going to draft me in the late first round. Right on. But I ended up having an injury here in L.A. against the UCLA Bruins. First play from scrimmage, popped my cartilage. It sounded like a, like a two-by-four being snapped. And, uh, and, but my team kept shooting me up with this stuff called cortisone so I wouldn't feel it. Right. And I ended up playing and making it worse my senior year. Okay. So when it got time for me to run for the, 40, for the NFL, I ran a slow time because I was hobbling like Igor. I yeah. was in so much pain. Yeah. Uh, turns out that I had cartilage just shattered all over the place. Amazing. And, uh, but I still made it to the NFL. Played four years. Right on, man. And so did you buy your mama a house? Uh, yes. You know how the black guy, they always yeah. buy mama you know, a house. Uh, mama. Hey, always the shout outs to mama, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but my dad was still around too, and I, and I blessed my dad too. Oh, nice. I love my dad. You do? Yeah. And who are you closest to? Grow Did you have both parents when you were growing up? I had up? both parents growing up. And who are you closest to? My mom. Uh, babe. I was, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was closer to my mom, I love, but I, my, my father, let me tell you, my father was so potent. And whatever he said to me, it stuck with me. It had more, it had more oomph, it had more power to it. So my father looked at me, and he didn't spend a lot of time with me because he's a truck driver, right. and he owned trucks, and he spent a lot of time working on the road. But the few words that he would say to me, the positive things about my identity, about who I was as a man, and, and I was his son, he said to me, he says, nobody's tougher than you. <laughs> that was enough to take me to the NFL and all that stuff. And so why were you closer to your mother then? Because I spent more time with her. She cooked the meals. She oh. talked to me. She, I was, she was taking me to my practices and all that kind of stuff. So just, just spending more time with her. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, and you became a pastor. Yes. Why? I fell in love with God. One of the greatest gifts I got from my parents. And my father would buy me motorbikes and go-karts and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Me and my siblings, we'd get just about everything we wanted for Christmas. But on my 16th birthday, my mom, who was in church, my father wasn't so much in church. He taught me the essence and the, and the importance of hard, working hard, hard work. He poured that into me. But my mother, she was instrumental in putting the faith in me, making me go to church when I didn't want to go. And, but on my 16th birthday, she bought me a Bible, blue Bible, I'll never forget it. And she had my name inscripted on the front. And that made me interested in reading the Bible. And from there, I started reading the Bible. At 17 years old, I gave my life to Jesus, 17. No more drinking, no more fornicating, no more sleeping around until I got married. All right. And I just walked with God. Even going to Arizona State at the time was known as the most partying school in the United States. Never went to one party. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't use profanity. Really? That's, that's just how God changed me. He just so were you called by God to be a pastor or did you go to school for it? Both. And why did you were called and you went to school? Yes. Why did you have to go to school if you were called by God? I wanted to do both. I, I just wanted to enhance my skills. So from, from being an athlete most of my life, you want to get as much advantage and be as great in, in a particular field as you can. So if I'm going to be a running back, I need the best running back coaches. I need to do extra sit push-ups and crunches and all the stuff that I need to do to be the best at it. Yes, I'm, I could be a great running back without doing that, but it would enhance me better if I got the education, and that's what I felt about and it. And you didn't believe that God would enhance it over education and everything? Uh, uh, he did. He did. Before, but without the education, though, you didn't believe that he was going to teach you and guide you and all that? He did. So why would you need to try to improve it by going to school? I wanted, I wanted more knowledge for me. I wanted more insight. Uh, and you and don't think he was going to, you didn't think he would give you that? He did give it, but he, that's a great question. Maybe I, maybe I, I should have just, just relied on him to do it, but I, I just wanted to get the education. And so why you didn't think, why you didn't know he was going to do that? If he called you, why you didn't know that he was going to prepare you, he was going to guide you? Because we don't know what he wanted us to do until right. we were doing it. Right. Why did you know that he was going to do that for you if he called you? He did, but I was around a lot of older pastors who were my mentors. They had gotten education, and I love the insight that they had. 
I love their study. I love their, their exegesis and their approach to the text. They just, they gave, gave more insight, you know, than, you I, than I did. And you trusted them more than God? No, I, I wouldn't say that, but, but that's a great question. I mean, it's a great way of putting it. I mean, yeah. maybe I should have just reconsidered that, but, but study has helped. It has enhanced me. It has helped with uh, administration, helped with assimilation with people in the church, coming to the church. It has helped, you know. But intellectual people don't know God. They just know about him. They have an idea, but they don't know him. Uh -huh. I believe that. I, I do believe but that. But you trusted the intellectual people. Well, here's the thing. Moses... God allowed him to do 40 years of training in Egypt, and he used that training and that knowledge. Of course, the Apostle Paul was a theologian of his time and one of the Sanhedrins, and God used that knowledge too, but just flipped it to where he gave him insight on who Christ was from the Old Testament, from the, from the boards to the colors, the, the, the blue, the purple, the scarlet, all of those things, the, the, the silver sockets, how they re represented redemption, it represented Christ. But you know, a little education doesn't hurt, but it's not, I don't think education is, is, is anti-God. But education cannot tell you about God, though. It only intellectually tell you about God, right. but it prevents most people from ever knowing God. <clears throat> and that's why most people don't know God, right. is because they've been educated about Him, mm -hmm. and they think they know Him just because they have an idea about right. Him. Right, right. Uh, yeah, that's what Paul said, knowledge puffeth up. Yeah. And, they, and then they think from their head that they can serve God, right. but it has to be in the heart. I totally get it, but it has, it has helped me. I'm not saying it didn't help. It has enhanced my ministry somewhat and uh, I've written books and stuff like that. And that helped me write the book and give me a better perspective on how to approach uh, the people and the ministry, stuff like that. And so, and how do you know God called you? Because he gave me a burden to do it. I just... Um, when I was in the world, I never dreamed of preaching. I never dreamed of doing works for people and helping people to know God and teaching the Bible to them and, and praying over them and all the things that comes with pastoring. Um, but when I gave my life to Christ at 17 years old, he began to groom me for, for pastoring and for teaching people the word. So much so that everywhere I went playing football from the time I got saved, to junior college, to Arizona State, to the Oakland Raiders, Al Davis made me the team chaplain. When I got to the Raiders, I didn't, even, I didn't even ask. And it was God showing me that he was, his hand was on me to teach and train, and he was showing me through different events like that. And who was Al Davidson? Al Davis. Who was he, he was the owner of the Oakland Raiders. Oh, the infamous I thought he was Al a Davis. rapper. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> <laughs> he okay. thought he was a rapper. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you teach people the Bible? Because God, it shows them who God is. It shows them the will of God, and it sets them free. But God said, let no man teach you. Okay. All right. And so if he said that, why do you teach people? Well, Ephesians 4 and 11 says that Jesus gave five gifts to the church. And it says, I've given them apostles, pastors, teachers, teachers, pastors, evangelists, and prophets. So I believe I'm a gift to the body of God when it comes to teaching the Bible and being a pastor. But those that he gave us, they didn't teach us about God. Right. They pointed the people back to God, which is within, and, and the Holy Spirit would teach us all things. Right. Because when human beings teach you, they puff you up with knowledge, right. and you never really know God. That's why most people who have the knowledge of God, they're not happy. They have no peace. Do you have perfect peace? I do. You have perfect peace? Yes. And what does that mean to have perfect peace? It means to have a relationship with God and not have a fear of death, knowing what's going to happen after this life. So I live the life that I currently live. I live it looking forward to my eternity with God. Do you have anger? Mm, yes. You do have anger. I have anger at what's happening in the world. I have anger at what's happening in the political scene. I have anger when I see them t trying to tell a boy he's a girl and telling a girl she's a guy. And that's, that brings me anger, righteous indignation. And why do you have anger about that? Because the, they're taking the children's innocence. And what good is that, your anger doing that, to know that? What good is it? It's driving me to work harder, yeah. to teach more, to get people, get volunteers, get other people to get involved so that we can save our children from this untoward generation. And... Uh, is anger of God or of the devil? It's of God. Is, so you believe God has anger? Yes. 
And, and why do you believe that? Uh, say, for example, Genesis chapter six, when God sent the flood. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, or you say, and it says, and the anger of God was kindled against so and so. So, so God shows anger. He shows pleasure. He shows uh, love. He shows types of expressions like us. Do so you, anger is one of the attributes of God. And do you believe that his anger is the same type of anger you have? Yeah. I, you, I, believe, I believe the Holy Spirit inside of me makes me angry. Really? Against evil and wickedness, lies, deception. When people murder people, when children are raped, those type of things. I, I do. I get righteous, uh, righteous indignation. And so how do you explain where God said, be angry and sin not? Well, it, 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 that right there, what you just said. He said, I'm allowing you room to be angry, but watch what you do with it. Because, see, just like laughter and uh, love and all of the emotions that we have, God gave it to us. And anger is really? one of the things he gave, it, gave us. Um, but discernment is what he was referring to, to be able to see what's wrong, mm -hmm. but don't be angry at what you see. And then in discernment, because it comes from God, you'll be able to deal with it. Because when you become angry at it, it controls you. You remember and when you Jesus... you become like what you You hate. remember when Jesus was in the temple? Right. And he saw the money changers right. and all these different people taking advantage of people. And he went outside and he made a whip he made it. Right. God took his time to make a whip and he went in there and he turned over their tables and drove them out. Why? Because he was angry. And you say he was emotional about it? Oh, absolutely. N no. That's you, what I, that's what. You can, you can see what's wrong and feel nothing about it and know that it's wrong because you're discerning it. Okay. And you can take strong action. But to another angry person, it looked like you're angry because they're angry and mm -hmm. they're overreacting. Mm -hmm. But Jesus didn't have the same thing because anger is of the devil. Anger is of the devil, Jesse? 100%. Okay. I, you know, I, this is my good first time hearing from, it. Nothing good come from anger. Really? Yeah. Okay. 